Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Helen Rappaport to the stage. Looks like we have a little bit of uh, technical malfunction. Is, uh, do we just have this screen? Sorry about that. Um, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all here. Um, it's wonderful to have been a part of this fantastic festival. I shall take some great memories away with me, and especially the sunshine. Um, so um, to make up for that, the sunshine will make up for the fact that we have here really a very sad story. And the reason I wrote my book, which I call Magnificent Obsession, and some of you, of course, will know, that's the name of a Hollywood film, Douglas Sirk, I think, nine, 1950s film. And you'll see that the reason I called my book that was because I felt very much, looking at the relationship of Victoria and Albert, it was all about her obsession with him. And it was indeed a magnificent obsession because it wasn't just an obsession with Albert living as her husband, but also this in intense obsession with Albert's dead and the, the de desire, the obsession with comm commemorating him, immortalizing him for many decades after his death. Now, the thing I think we all know about them, if we know anything, is this kind of image of the archetypal, gorgeous, bourgeois, domestic Victorian family. And it was an image, of course, that Victoria and Albert created. And it was mainly really Albert who created that image of uh, domestic respect, respectability, husband and wife, lovi loving with children. Because the extraordinary thing about Victoria and Albert's relationship right from the start is that they were entirely monogamous. And in the history of royal marriages, how many marriages were actually monogamous? Normally, the consort to a queen had a mistress and another establishment even. And this was the exception with Victoria and Albert right from the start. And because they were respectable and it, deeply ordinary in many ways, it made them so much more accessible as monarchs. And they become the sort of standard to which other people um, in, in Britain aspired to that kind of life with loving children. And they were, of course, amazingly lucky. When you think about it, and the, it's something I can't get over, is that Victoria and Albert had nine children. Victoria was barely four foot 11 tall. She popped out all those babies. No, 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 but no miscarriages that we know of, certainly no stillbirths. She was incredibly robust. When you look at the demographic for that time, um, one in every five babies born didn't survive the first five years. They were so lucky to have had a marriage that saw nine sure healthy children born. Well, I say healthy. One, of course, was a hemophiliac. And the thing that hits you when you read the story of Albert's death and the f his final terrible decline was that until 1861, the year he died, he and Victoria had never had a close-at-hand experience of a death in the family. They hadn't lost any children. Here they are in a famous photograph taken in 1857 with all their children. And they had done, during that time, those 21 years of marriage up to Albert's death, really um, got rid of that awful reputation of the dissolution of the Hanoverian monarchs. They'd moved the monarchy forward into the image, really, that has been sustained um, right through to our current queen. But I do feel, and I'm, you may think I'm controversial in this, I do feel there is, a, at the heart of their relationship, a bit of a misconception. Because people say to me over and over again, oh, it was a great love affair, wasn't it? And I disagree. I mean, we have this image. Here's the, the tweeting, twee image of the lovebirds when Victoria, of course, as queen, had to propose to Albert. He did not have the right as her social inferior to propose to her. Um, people have this uh, idea that it was this wonderful, glorious love affair. Uh, in fact, it was a deeply turbulent one. Victoria was very histrionic, very demanding. She suffered bouts of extreme 
postnatal depression, uh, not to mention PMT. I'm sure she had lots of hissy fits because there are occasions when she's described as throwing cups at Albert or slamming doors and going off in a rage. So it was a, it was a dynamic relationship. It was turbulent. They didn't sit there gazing at each other lovingly all the time. So I don't want you to have that idea that they did. Also, right from the start, I think there was a big difference in the way they loved each other. Albert was very much the passive partner who allowed Victoria to gush and love and adore and worship him, to hang on his every word. So she was the volcano of passion, the torrent, constantly pouring forth love, adoration. Albert was this, that, and the other. He was too perfect for words. And Albert, in a way, kind of let it all wash over him to a point where I think later in their relationship, it became too much. He wanted some space from her. But for Victoria, th he was the one and only man in her life. My hero, my glorious and exceptionally great husband. And she looked upon him really almost like a medieval knight. Uh, you know, this heroic figure. And this was one of her favorite paintings of him. She had done for um, his 25th birthday in 1844. But tr tragically, that heroic image, this handsome prince you know he really was very very beautiful in his youth that image very quickly um dissipated because albert was a workaholic and when he married victoria he was desperate for a role he wasn't allowed to be king and he had to make himself feel that he was useful and so what did he do he he turned and diverted all his energies and frustrations into doing many different things that made him feel useful. You know, he became involved in endless committees and institutions, chair of this, patron of that. And basically, in this quest to find a useful role, Albert very quickly wore himself out. And there's quite a sharp decline in his physical appearance. You see it. I mean, he's barely 41 here. He's, he's balding, he's paunchy. And in that final year of his life, you can see an exhaustion in his face. He's fading, the eyes sad, sort of watery. And this is um, one of the last photographs taken of him. And next to it, an engraving of around the same time. And you can see how much that heroic medieval prince is really looking tired and aging rapidly. Um, and really, uh, one of the theories of my book and um, I don't have time to go into the detail because it's actually very really complex, is that I don't think for one minute Albert died of typhoid fever. I do not believe that stale old claim, and I've got a whole appendix in my book in which I argue, Albert definitely had some kind of long-standing chronic gap, uh, condition in his gut, the kind of condition that would flare up at times of stress and anxiety and then go into remission. If it's time, I'll mention it. But what really pushed him over the edge in that final year of his life was a series of crises, which all of them, in their different ways, triggered uh, this, this a very de sensitive gut he had. He suffered a lot from um, um, diarrhea and stomach cramps and various manifestations of something like colitis, but I'll come to that later. In that final year, there were a succession of things that really pushed Albert to breaking point. And the first was the death in March of 1861 of Victoria's mother, the Duchess of Kent. Now, as I said, until then, Albert and Victoria had had no experience of the death at close hand of a family member. Um, and Albert, by the time the Duchess died, had been become deeply, deeply attached to her. And in fact, Albert had done a lot to affect a rapprochement between the mother and daughter who become very alienated. I mean, when Victoria met her mother, uh, um, met Albert, she couldn't get away from her mother quickly enough. So when her mother died, there was the opening of floodgates of remorse and this kind of hysterical response to her mother's death that in many ways I think was a response uh, a reflection of Victoria's sense of guilt that she uh, sort of elbowed her mother out when she met Albert. In fact, for many years before that, she tried to 
distance herself. And Ar Albert carried the burden of this torrent of grief that was unleashed in Victoria. And he not only had to deal with that, but with his own grief. And so that began to wear him down in, from March 61. And then something later in the year also increased his sense of despair, um, which was the death of a young king you probably never heard of. His name was Pedro V of Portugal. Now, Albert and Victoria are quite closely related to him. Albert had kind of taken Pedro under his wing as his idea of a young, reforming, constitutional monarch. He was the, a sort of a protege of Albert's in whom Albert invested hope for a f the future of a better kind of monarchy across Europe. And the other reason, of course, was that because um, Albert and Victoria were so deeply and utterly disappointed in their own son and heir. And, uh, you know, Pedro was the kind of son and heir that Albert wished they both had. Well, Bertie, poor Bertie. He couldn't do anything right in his parents' eyes, could he? We all know the stories of his lifetime of womanizing and drinking and smoking cigars and, and gambling and this, that, and the other. Well, Bertie, the more expectation his parents placed on him to behave and be dutiful and apply himself to his studies and be a good prince of Wales, the more he kicked over the traces. And Albert could be a real martinet with his children. He had enormous expectations of academic excellence. Bertie was a dunce. He was never, ever going to be bright. His tutors wrote him off. Um, but worse than that, he was rebellious. And they couldn't bear that, that he did not knuckle down. So what did they do? Well, uh, they sent him off to the Curra in Ireland, which is a military training camp because Albert thought that they would knock some sense into him. A good bit of, you know, parade drill and a bit of army discipline would do, do him a good thing. And but unfortunately, what in fact happened was when Bertie went off to the Curra, um, as he was coming to the end of this military training, his friends, his officer friends, invited a lady of the town into his room as a, a sort of parting gift. And Bertie lost his virginity to a woman called Nellie Clifton. Now... The awful thing about this from Victoria and Albert's point of view was very quickly Nellie, who was not the most discreet of women, went round blabbing about it and you know, bragging that she bedded the Prince of Wales. And very quickly, it was the continental press that picked up on this gossip. And there are Victoria and Albert, totally oblivious to the fact that their son has, you know, you blotted the family copybook. And remember that image of respectability, um, of decency, of monogamy that they'd worked so hard to create, particularly Albert, and Bertie's gone and ruined it all because everyone's gossiping about this affair. Eventually, Victoria and Albert were informed about this. They were told about the rumors. And Albert absolutely went into meltdown. Talk about a hysterical overreaction. I think most monarchs and most, even most Victorian fathers at the time would say, oh, well, rites of passage. Every young man's got to go out and, you know, lose his virginity somewhere. But no, Albert absolutely became obsessed that Bertie was now going to bring the whole of the British monarchy into disrepute. Um, that, oh, what would happen if Nellie got pregnant or tried to blackmail the family or sold her story to the papers? And he kind of saw this enormous scenario of scandal developing. And so he went off to lecture Bertie. He took himself off to a place called Maidingley near Cambridge. Now, Bertie had been packed off to Cambridge University. Like I say, he wasn't very bright and he wasn't enjoying it. And Albert had deliberately made him stay in accommodation outside the city so he didn't mix too much with local people. Albert goes off to Maidingley, takes... Bertie, for a good dressing down, walking around lots of country lanes in the pouring rain. So he gets very wet, very exhausted, returns to Windsor the next day in a state of utter physical collapse, having lectured his son for 24 hours on his responsibilities. And 
what happens? This complaint he'd had, this gut complaint flares up. He gets these stomach cramps, he gets temperature, he's suffering from insomnia, uh, he can't eat, he can't sit, he can't rest. He's pacing around, getting more and more agitated. Now, you'd think that might be enough on his plate to deal with, but now we come to a crisis that really you will all recognize being Americans, the Trent Affair. In the summer uh, um, of uh, 1861, civil war is raging in America, and um, two Confederate agents named Slidell and Mason picked up an English packet boat in the West Indies to sail to Europe to galvanize fundraise support for the Confederates. Now, Britain, as you know, was neutral. So the Brits were absolutely incensed when the Americans stopped the mail, the British-owned mail packet, the Trent, boarded it, and hauled off the two agents, Slidell and Mason. Now, this should have been just a, a diplomatic incident at the most. But it very, very quickly blew up into an enormous um, a co a cause celebre at, to the point where there was talk of Britain going to war with the USA because the British Prime Minister Palmerston was very, very belligerent, as too was the Queen at this time. And there was talk of war. Albert was absolutely horrified. The last thing... And he especially wanted to see was conflict and war. You've got to remember, this is not that long after the end of the Crimean War, which had been a disaster for Britain. And it was Albert who was instrumental at this point in, in intervening. Palmerston wanted to send a very, very aggressive memorandum to Lincoln, um, uh, you know, threatening war and this, that, and the other. And Albert intervened and took the memorandum and sat up all through the night uh, toning it down, modifying it. But he was in a very serious state now. He was now really, really sick. And it, it, if we look back on it, it probably was his, the last thing he did for Britain uh, because the memorandum, this revised memorandum, then was sent off to um, America. And then there's this ghastly wait of a couple of weeks to find out what's going to happen. And in fact, it really got very serious to the point where Brits, Britain was actually sending troops out to Canada ready to go to war with the USA. Uh, horrible. So in the midst of all this mental excitement, as Albert's doctors put it, um, he's pacing around. They can't get him to take to his bed. They cannot make him rest. And in the end, after days and days, our best part of a week since he got very chilled at going to dress down Bertie, um, he takes to his bed in the Blue Room, which is uh, at Windsor Castle. You can see it if you go there. I think, I think it's open to the public to see. Um, he took to the Blue Room, and he finally, really rapidly began to sink. And on that Sunday, the 8th of December... The family, Queen and all the other children, went off to church, um, leaving Albert in the care of Alice, their second daughter, Princess Alice. Now, Alice was very astute. She could tell her father was dying. She was a very good nurse because she'd nursed, in fact, been devotedly nursing the Duchess of Kent through her final illness. Albert, Alice also was a beautiful musician, and as Albert lay there on the bed, he asked her to play some of his favorite music on the organ, and she played him um, Lutheran hymns like Nun danket alle Gott, wachtet auf, and his favorite hymn, Rock of Ages. And it was clear to Alice he was dying and sinking fast, but meanwhile, the doctors and Victoria herself were in a state of utter denial, refusing to recognize how desperately ill Albert was. Now, on the left is Dr. James Clark, who was a doctor who trained during the Napoleonic Wars, had been with Queen Victoria since her childhood, and he brought in a man named William Jenner on the right, who had been one of the first to distinguish the difference between typhoid fever and typhus. Now, there was much muttering about fever 
in inverted commas, by the two doctors. Neither of them ever actually said the word typhoid, because quite honestly, and I've looked at the evidence, neither of them were really sure what, what was wrong with him. And the reason they weren't is that I think Albert probably was suffering from Crohn's disease, which he had had developing for years, for decades. And that this final manifestation of illness, temperature, and insomnia, and pain, and stomach cramps was a final crisis where the disease had led to a blockage in his gut and septicemia had set in. So that evening, you know, they decide they have to issue a bulletin to the public. Um, and the first bulletin was very vague and said he was just suffering from a fever and, and that there was nothing to worry about, basically. But by the Friday the 13th, in the late afternoon, there was a serious turn for the worst. And there were subtle changes in the bulletins about Albert's state of um, increasing um, restlessness. And it was not till, now this is appalling, I think, not till that night, Friday the 13th of December, that Victoria, who had still not sent for Bertie, poor Bertie is in Cambridge. Albert's son and heir is in Cambridge, hasn't been informed. Alice, his sister, took it upon herself to send a telegram saying, for heaven's sake, get back, get back to Windsor now. But, but, you know, father is dying. And if she hadn't done that, Bertie would not have been there. So the most extraordinary thing in this story I discovered when I was doing the research was that night in the churches across Britain, it, they were full of people. The churches across the country were packed with people at prayer. There were prayer meetings all over the country. But they weren't praying for Albert. They were praying there wasn't going to be a war with America. And it's astonishing that the British public had no idea Albert was literally at death's door. Um, on the following morning, he briefly rallied. But by half past four on December the 14th, it was clear the end was about to come. And the youngest children were brought in to say goodbye to their father. And there is a representation of that scene. It's not terribly accurate because the children were brought in to say goodbye and then taken away again. But um, then over the next few hours, Albert rapidly was sinking. Now, Victoria, until the, almost the last moments, had refused to accept how ill Albert was. She could not conceive of the, her one and only, her man, her all, dying, being taken from her. And um, what was so terrible was, therefore, when he did finally die, he died at 10 to 11 that night. She, of course, was completely catatonic with shock. And um, then the government and the, um, the, the royal household had to pass on the news to the public. And, of course, it was sun, uh, Saturday evening. The papers, there weren't that many Sunday papers. What, what papers there were had already gone to press. And um, so there was going to be a problem about passing on the news. But meanwhile, and I find this very, very interesting, the minute Albert died, a death mask was taken off his face. His he was photographed on his deathbed by William Bambridge. And um, also plaster casts were taken off his hands, which later in her life, well, throughout her widowhood, Victoria clutched her in bed at night. She clutched the plaster cast of Albert's hand. Now, this photograph is in the Royal Archives, and I managed, with that bit of wrangling, to get permission to put it in my book because it's never been publicly shown before. But what's interesting about it, the image was clearly taken just after they'd done the death mask, death mask because you can see his hair's been disarranged. So from that moment on, the, 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 the process the, of memorialization kicks in. And um, everything now focuses on telling the people. And how the British people were told was by the bells. And there are some extraordinary descriptions of how, after Albert died, um, news was sent to, um, to the mayor of London to ring the bell, the great bell of St. Paul's. And that spread the news across London. 
And so people who had gone to bed suddenly heard the bells tolling. And then the following morning, Sunday morning, the bells were ringing out across the country as people went to church. And so how people heard the news was as they turned up for church that day, they heard this terrible, terrible tolling of the bells. Um, and people were deeply shocked. How on earth could a young man of 42 die so suddenly and without warning? And the newspapers, of course, didn't come out properly till the next day, Monday the 16th. And they were absolutely blanket coverage, big black borders, about, uh, mourning the death of Albert. And this, of course, presented a very important moment in, in, in British royal history, and that was a major state funeral. Because the last time anyone um, had died that senior in the royal family, in fact, had been the daughter of the Prince Regent, Princess Charlotte, who died after giving birth to a stillborn boy in 1817. Um, but Albert's death immediately struck many people as a terrible national calamity of almost biblical proportions. Because why? Well, he had eff effectively been king in all but name. And people were guilt-stricken because they'd never sufficiently valued him during his lifetime. There'd been so much hostility to Albert as a German, an interloper. He'd never really been valued. He'd been endlessly criticized. And people like Disraeli, the politician, said, you know, at the time of his uh, funeral, we buried our sovereign. And so there was this terrible breast-beating across the country. But people... Um, of course, were going to be disappointed because they were not going to get a state funeral. Albert, meanwhile, was laid out in the uniform of a field marshal by his favorite valet. And this beautiful painting by Winterhalter is of him in that uniform. And then, of course, the traditional Victorian thing, which Victoria was very much Victoria's obsession of placing things in the coffin was done. Lots of hair, photos of the children. All kinds of objects were placed in the coffin. But one thing I discovered in the research of this book that I find really, really deeply significant was Victoria had a copy of this painting, this portrait of herself done in 1843 of a, a, a slightly sexualized queen. It's not a standard picture of a queen by any means, is it, with a slightly, you know, déshabillé look, the hair down the shoulder... It's a suggestion of love and sensuality in her private life with Albert. And that painting was done for Albert and kept in his private rooms, not on display to the public until the Queen's first jubilee, our Queen's jubilee in 77. Now, she had a copy of that put in Albert's hand in the coffin. And to me, that absolutely summarized everything she felt she was going to miss about Albert, the in intimacy, their sexual passion together, their life, their private life together. Now, meanwhile, the planning for Albert's funeral went ahead, but of course, he had insisted in his will he did not want a state funeral. So it was a private funeral in St. George's Chapel, Windsor, and it was an entirely male funeral. Now, I don't think people realize Queen Victoria did not attend the funeral. Women conventionally in middle-class and upper-class society didn't go to funerals at that time. They were considered too emotional and too weepy. She didn't go. She actually was virtually forcibly removed to Osborne to get her out of the way of all the suffering of Albert's funeral and death. And she we went to Osborne in a state of absolute hysteria. So no lying in state. The British people had no opportunity to say goodbye to Albert, which is tragic, really. Um, and the only officiants, really, at the funeral were the two sons, Bertie and his brother Arthur, because Leopold the haemophiliac was in Cannes for his health. Alfred, the, the older brother, was away in the Navy. And I always think, looking at that image, it's slightly reminiscent of William and Harry at Diana's funeral. Um, it, I find it very moving that those two young boys had to take 
the responsibility of commemorating their father that day. Now, life for Victoria immediately after Albert's death sunk into this terrible, terrible um, state of gloom. She said the most heartbreaking things about being all alone. And in fact, you see, the, being queen is a lonely position. Albert was the only person she could be intimate and private with, not just you know, physically in bed, but in terms of what she could talk about. And one of the most telling things she said was, there is nobody to call me du anymore. Now, du is the German intimate form of Z, the formal for you. And, and it was only Albert who had, to write, had the right to call her du. And she said, losing him was like tearing the flesh from my bones. Because there wasn't a single aspect of her life where she hadn't depended on him. You know, he was husband, friend, advisor, um, you know, father of all her children. But she had hung on his advice, particularly in dealing with all the massive business of affairs of state. Um, so as far as she was concerned, her life was over. And I think it's very clear when you look at the evidence that depression set in and that Victoria went through a period of, I would say, deep, um, a deep um, bereavement where now she would probably be sent for counselling and certainly have been in therapy. And everyone, of course, began to get very worried about this. The government could see that the business of government was not going to be done, that she was completely capitulating. And so they were anxious to get her back working for the monarchy. But, of course, instead she completely retreated. And these photos she allowed um, about six months later show the extent of her retreat um, in black. Uh, even her youngest daughter was dressed in black. That's little Beatrice there. And um, these were the only images that the public saw of her, really, during her long widowhood, always gazing up at Albert longingly. Um, but weirdly, one of the things on here, the image that she projected, the widow the widow's image, and then was emulated by other widows. And there was this whole kind of culture then of widowhood that other women copied. And it prompted um, a boom in the jet industry, of all things, because Victoria banned the use of any colored jewelry at court. Women were only uh, allowed to wear silver and black. So ev everyone went crazy buying jet jewelry. And the, the jet industry in Britain boomed for a while. But meanwhile, she really now became absorbed in her huge obsession, which, of course, was to memorialize Albert. And one of the first things she did was be, um, a competition was arranged for um, a design for the Albert Memorial, which is in Hyde Park, just opposite the Royal Albert Hall. You may know it. And um, this started construction, but took quite a long time to, to complete. Meanwhile, Victoria spent her own private money on creating a, a mausoleum for Albert's body and eventually her own down at Frogmore, which is down from Windsor Castle. And Albert, meanwhile, was his coffin at the funeral had been taken down below into the vault below St. George's Chapel. Meanwhile, ba uh, Baron Marachetti, one of their favorite scu um, sculptors, created this effigy of Albert. And at the same time, Victoria commissioned him to create an effigy of her. Now, hers, of course, had to go into cold storage for about 40 years until she died. And, and when, when she did die, no one knew where they put it. So they had trouble finding it. But anyway, and Marachetti, interestingly, referenced the death mask for that effigy. So as the years went on, the memorialization of Albert continued. I might have to speed up a bit here. Um, every town, city, village, you name it, had something with Albert's name on. A street, a pub, uh, an institution, a statue. Everywhere across the country, there was this imposition by Victoria of some kind of visual reference to her adored husband. But of course... Uh, um, her own popularity with the nation was rapidly sinking. 
because, of course, she'd completely retreated from public life. Here she was playing the grieving wi widow well beyond the, the normal two years of mourning, so much so that she was disappearing away more and more and more to Balmoral. Now, Balmoral was 600 miles away from the seat of government. Imagine the frustration of the prime ministers and the ministers trying to run the country, being made to get on long train rides to go and consult with the Queen at Balmoral. And she was so stubborn, so selfish. And there are times I get so infuriated with her during her widowhood because she would not give an inch. You know, everything had to be done on her terms. She wouldn't even go and open Parliament, uh, except a couple of times when she wanted a dowry for one of her daughters. And her ministers are getting frantic. You know, the monarch should be on display. Look at how our wonderful queen in England, still uh, in her 90s, goes out and does the job. And Vict imagine if our queen had behaved in the way Victoria had. And in the end, the only things that began to make a difference were the emergence, of course, in her life of John Brown, the devoted Highland servant. And she was coaxed to go out for pony rides. And of course, the reason John Brown became such an important figure in her life is the same reason that Lord Melbourne did become important to us, the young queen. Although I hasten to add that Lord Melbourne did not look like Rufus Sewell. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, the, he was much older and fatter and greyer when Victoria came to the throne. But it's exactly the same thing happening. Here is Victoria. She was actually, when you think about it, very simple. What did she need? She needed to be looked after. She needed a man in her life. She needed a strong arm, someone to make her feel safe and look taken care of, which is exactly the function that John Brown um, performed so much so that of course you start seeing cartoons like this one John Brown exercising the Queen it says and so there was this terrible um, gossip going on well I'm not going to go into that I can't and a lot of anti-monarchical feeling was growing and people were really saying you know well look she's not going to do the job she should abdicate give the give, you know pass it on to Bertie and at the point where things were really getting serious, she kind of rescued herself by writing or publishing her journal of her life in the Highlands with Albert. And here's the cover, Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands, which became an unexpected bestseller. And it kind of rehabilitated her a little bit in the nation's eyes, because in it they could read about the wonderful, cozy life they had sort of stomping through the heather and having picnics by the roadside, you know, at Balmoral. But the complaints, official complaints, about her abdication of public duty continued. And um, by the end of the 1860s, there are so serious challenges. And then one of her major projects bears fruit when in 1871, Victoria was dragged, kicking and screaming almost, to open the Royal Albert Hall, which had been Albert's brainchild. He had had the idea for this wonderful institution before he died. And then, just at the point where Gladstone, now Prime Minister, was complaining that the Queen was invisible, um, heaven sent them a glorious dispensation, as someone described it, because someone, uh, because Bertie, was taken very, very seriously ill with actual typhoid fever in November 1861. And just at the crucial moment approaching the 10th anniversary of his father's death, people were contemplating something awful, which was, would the Prince of Wales actually die on his father's anniversary? Well, luckily, Bertie pulled through, but the crowds were queuing up outside Mansion House, um, uh, Marlborough House, waiting for news throughout the crisis. He did pull through, and Gladstone told the Queen in no uncertain terms, you, because the whole nation had been praying, praying for his well-being, well you've now got to go out to your public and thank them for their support, for their, prepare, for their prayers. And so she went to a big Thanksgiving service in February 1872, and that was the first bit of royal ceremonial, really, since Albert's death. Now, imagine the public had hardly seen their queen in all that time. And then to cap it, three days later, 
an Irish Fenian tried to take a pot shot or tried to attack the Queen. I don't know if he had a gun. And again, there was another outpouring of public sympathy for her and the monarchy because, oh God, the Queen might have been killed. So again, she's let off the hook. But there would have been, I think, if these things hadn't happened, a really serious Republican challenge to Victoria at this time. And gradually, in the 70s, especially with the return of Benjamin Disraeli, who, with whom she developed a very adoring, mutually adoring, sycophantic relationship, um, Victoria gradually came back into public view. But not, you know, never ever in the way she had been on public display when Albert was alive. And finally, in 1875, the Albert Memorial that she had, that had begun construction after his death, the gilded statue was put in position. And um, it, it's, it's wonderful, because you see, by the end of her reign in the 90s, 80s, 90s, particularly through her great jubilees, the queen becoming this great imperial um, emblem of uh, dignity, mother of the nation, doyenne of sovereigns, grandmama of Europe she is here at the wedding in Coburg in 1894, where you can see the Kaiser and Nicholas and Alexander and various relatives. And people only now, at the end of the century, really were beginning to call themselves Victorians. Because during Albert's lifetime, really they were Albertians. All that prudery and straight-laced behavior and uh, moral rectitude were very much Albert's creation, not Victoria's. And there is a final coda to the story that, of course, then puts the queen on another level where she now is above criticism. And this is tragic because in December 1878, her daughter, Princess Alice, who had nursed Albert so devotedly, fell ill after nursing her entire family with diphtheria. And on the 14th of December, 1878, the very same day as her father, Alice, died. And so that kind of put the lid on it. You couldn't criticize Queen Victoria anymore. And so she continued, as we know, and finally herself died in 1901. And there she is on her deathbed, wrapped in her wedding veil of honnet and lace. And you'll notice the picture of Albert on his deathbed on the bedhead there in the right-hand corner. And eventually, so her body joined his in the um, mausoleum at Frogmore, um, fulfilling at last the words that were inscribed over the entrance. Farewell, best beloved. Here at last I shall rest with thee. With thee in Christ I shall rise again. And... Finally, if you want to know more about this story, I describe it in great detail, that period of darkness the Queen lived through um, after Albert died. And I also have a long explanation what I think killed him. Actually, in the end, it was pneumonia that carried him off in the last couple of days. And I also wrote the time book for the first series of PBS Victoria. And um, thank you for having me here. It's been a wonderful experience. <laughs>